Okay, good. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm presenting on behalf of my um, uh, co-authors, James Firmara and John Wright, both at LDC. Um, as you all know, language recognition has enjoyed a steady interest over more than two decades. Um, for example, it was a technical area in Eurospeech in 1995 and has been a technical area in every interspeech since then. It has uh, been the topic of a NIST LRE campaign in 96 and 2003, and then has been roughly biennial ever, ever since then. And many inter international teams have competed in those NIST evaluations, including our friends from Bruneau uh, University of Technology, who've done very well in them. As you also know, the LRE corpora vary along a number of dimensions. Uh, some of them are multilingual, so packaging all of the uh, languages together in a single set, attempting to collect them. Uh, consistently. Others are uh, released separately, still attempting to collect uh, in, a, in a consistent way across languages. The source data can be found, so often broadcast news if it's found, but also sometimes web speech, um, or can be created specifically for the purpose, so that would often be telephone speech uh, or read and prompted speech in some of the earlier corpora, in fact in some modern corpora too. And it also uh, they also vary to, in the degree to which they are controlled uh, or annotated or audited or allowed to be or assumed to be in the language. So you find the clip which is purported to be in language X. The question is, do you actually validate it or do you just assume that the clip is in language X? Or if it's a broadcast, if it's an hour long broadcast, do you assume it's been no code switching? So the same language through the whole way or do you validate? Um, more importantly, um, features of LRE corpora are that uh, demand exceeds supply always. Um, that read and prompted speech corpora, for example, common voice, tend to have a greater percentage of the data validated uh, uh, than, than the ones that are uh, uh, broadcast news, for example. Um, and I guess the sad news is that few of the world's languages are actually covered. So if you take, you know, the 107 in uh, Vox Lingua and add it to all other languages covered in all other LRE corpora, you still don't get 5% of the world's languages covered. Um, and unfortunately, there is a large proportion inside of any of those corpora of segments of speech which are not validated. They're just assumed to be in the language of the rest of the clip, of the rest of the file. So our question was, could we augment the availability of uh, LRE data through what we call novel incentives, workforces, and workflows? And I'll explain that next. So um, this problem of many of us working to build data sets but still not keeping up with demand has been on as long as I've been in the field and that's a long time. Um, however, we know that people contribute to activities if they're given adequate incentives. So we've got a project funded by the US National Science Foundation called NEW, and the idea is to provide novel incentives uh, that may attract new workforces. Those workforces need uh, unique workflows to help them perform successfully. Uh, and so we've done many things in this project, but the one I want to talk about today uh, is this using games. So we built a portal called Lingo Boingo, it's pictured there, um, and it has games in it from us and our partners. So this is uh, University of Essex, QMUL, Sorbonne, Loria, uh, University of Pennsylvania, and our own games. And the idea was to cross promote and join forces to uh, increase the play of these games with a purpose that produced data that the community wants. Um, and also to study the impact of outreach efforts, not just in terms of increase in number of hits, but the quality of the hits. So do the hits actually turn into data that you can actually use, right? Uh, and then we wanted to add one game. That's what I'm going to talk about now. So that game uh, we call Name That Language, originally designed to look like this, but then we learned uh, just by watching traffic to the site that many, many, many people were coming to play the game from Twitter and therefore using mobile devices. And so uh, the game needed to be redesigned to be uh, uh, responsive to screen size for mobile devices. <laughs> So the way you play the game is you play the clip like that, and then you guess what language is uh, being spoken. You get points for correct answers and lose points for uh, lose shots for incorrect answers. Anybody want to guess the language that was spoken? Yeah. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Um, the I the uh, that's a mistake. The uh, it's actually French. Uh, the clip uh, associated with the playback wasn't the same clip from the game. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, that's, it normally tells you the correct answer. 
Uh, I added that clip after the fact it was French, a variety of French. Um, so that's how you play the original game. Uh, uh, this game was based on one called The Great Language Game, uh, where you listen to clips uh, picked from multiple choices and, of course, maximize your points before you lose all your lives. We uh, innovated in a couple of ways. Um, so many of the games, The Great Language Game and all of its imitators, have a relatively small number of clips. So in The Great Language Game, for example, they collected something like 18 million judgments over about 5,000 clips. But as you probably guess, once you've got sort of 20 judgments for a clip, having more doesn't really help you know what language it's in. And in any case, they knew what language the clips were in before they put them into the game. So we added uh, clips where we don't have validation, clips that came from these corpora that I mentioned that are missing validations. And this uh, feature called a bonus round where points are doubled, um, but there's no feedback about whether you've got the correct answer. And then we use performance on known clips to predict performance on suspected clips, okay? Clips where we don't have uh, validation. Um, and uh, there are a number of game parameters that can be changed within the code of the game, which we chose not to, choose, not to change uh, until we had finished running through one data set about six to 7,000 clips because we didn't, we know that if you change the way you ask the question, the answer could change potentially. And we wanted to have a consistently annotated corpus. So the input data came from a couple of sources. Um, you see the languages there on the left. Um, and then known clips are clips that were in a previously LDC published corpus where experts had annotated it for language. Suspected clips were in corpora where we think we know the language because it was an entire hour of broadcast, say VOA in a given language, but actually it's not a safe assumption that all of VOA in French, for example, is actually in French or in, in, uh, in English for that matter. Um, and we were going for, um, well, I guess there's uh, audio on here anyway. Yeah, so um, I covered all that. Um, and what I wanted to say is that uh, you can't assume that the number, that the language of any individual clip is in fact the language of the purported whole broadcast because there are broadcast preemptions, because there are schedule changes, and because there are voiceovers uh, and multilingual. Hoy nos sentimos seguros de convivir en un entorno continental donde las normas del derecho que rigen bà Salvador nói rằng nước bà cảm thấy an toàn khi được sinh sống trong một khu vực. Um, anybody recognize what, what happened there? So this was actually a broadcast in VOA Vietnamese. Um, and what happened was they um, cut to a speech being given by someone, I'm not sure who, in Spanish. And then a few seconds into the clip, the voiceover comes in from the journalist and, and explains what's happening in the Spanish clip in Vietnamese. So this is why you can't assume that because the program's called VOA Vietnamese, it actually is. Uh, and so we attempted to have the prior probabilities of uh, any, guessing any, um, uh, of any language being guessed be equal across them, but you see there's actually two mistakes, just a mistake in the coding that we ended up with more English and uh, Japanese clips than the other languages. Uh, over time, we uh, made the game available and then did some various kinds of outreach to increase playership of the game. So those red lines represent the moments when we, uh, over the history of the game, two and a half year history of the game, when we put posts on Facebook, Twitter, uh, SciStarter, which is a portal for citizen science. Uh, we were named as a SciStarter top project, and so there was a blurb in Discovery Magazine about the game. Uh, the Great Language Game cross-linked to us, LDC newsletter, and uh, the linguist list, and all those had these little bumps, which sometimes tailed off. Uh, eventually, you see that the um, community is somehow self-sustaining. There are bumps that are happening now in the playership that we're not creating because people are mentioning the game to each other on social media. We're not doing it, and those are... Uh, continuing. So there have been days when we've gotten 15,000 uh, hits per day, and it's around 1,000 a day, and sometimes as low as 500 per day, uh, still, still going on. Uh, and uh, here's an example of this thing being self-sustaining. So that gigantic spike right, be right before uh, vertical line seven is because um, a YouTube influencer found the game, played it, made a vlog uh, yeah, made a vlog about playing the game, and suddenly we were very popular in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. Uh, unfortunately, there was no Mongolian in the game at the time, but we had you know, thousands of clips from Mongolia for a couple of days. Uh, if you look at the distribution of players around the world, thanks, uh, you'll see that we've um, um, recruited 45,000 player IDs in total. 
Each of those pins can represent more than one player. And the dispersion suggests, sorry, suggests that we could successfully expand the range of languages and find people who speak those languages to be able to play the game successfully. Uh, this is the result of aggregating play uh, over the uh, over all judgments. So this, what this shows you is each of the lines represents the language. Um, the x-axis is the um, number of uh, people who've played that clip and, and guessed it. And the y-axis is the percent that they've gotten correct. And the aggregation is the simplest possible aggregation. Um, this is, again, using known clips. It's simple voting, dead simple voting, uh, where ties lose. So if two people say it's English and one person says it's German, we think it's English. If one says English, one says French, one says German, we think we got it wrong. That's how simple the voting is. So just using that simple voting, we get this kind of uh, performance from the crowd. And what you see is that we, uh, the crowd is guessing correctly 95% of the time after there have been 13 hits for any language regardless of the language, and 98% uh, of the time if there have been 17 plays for any language. However, for some languages, you only need, uh, in the case of English, two or three plays before you know the clip is actually in English. Um, and you should also realize that um, this variation in performance is not just by language, but it's also probably by crowd, right? Because you see the crowd is around the world. And if I um, don't plot this you know, in the rigorous way by making 20 or 30 random draws from the data set and then summing them, but actually look at the performance the way it happened over time, you see the performance per language going up and down as we manage to attract people from a given country, okay? Uh, here's the resulting corpus, uh, the data in the resulting corpus. This shows you uh, languages and then how many um, clips have 15 or 13 judgments, how many have uh, whatever the language specific threshold is to reach 98% accuracy or 95% accuracy and some other data. Of the 66,080 clips, 6,680 clips, 540 didn't converge on the correct answer, even though we had the number of clips that that last graph would suggest. Um, so 498 of those happened for obvious reasons. They're like musical interludes in VOA programming, or they'll actually play whole songs. Um, and then they'll also sometimes speak over the song. And so the speech activity detector thought that was speech, grabbed it, and the crowd recognized that it wasn't what it was supposed to be. Often anyway, it's in the wrong language. So in you know, VOA, I don't know, French, maybe you've got um, American jazz playing. Okay, um, and in 42, um, in 42 clips, the language was actually in question. Those were audited, thanks. Um, and of those, there are only 23 that are questionable. The remainder, the crowd did the correct thing. So the miss rate uh, is also really quite low. The resulting corpus is like this. It's called the NTL language recognition corpus. It'll be released shortly through LDC at no cost. Um, I mentioned how many clips are in it. These are IPR and IRB cleared, so they're not scraped from an unknown site, so you don't know if you're allowed to use them. You can, you can use them under the LDC license, but, but at free cost. There are uh, almost three quarters of a million judgments um, that have that kind of data, the file name, the languages, the distractors that were offered at the time, where the person's from, date, and so forth. Um, and so I think to wrap this up, that what this shows is a proof of concept for the idea of novel incentives. That is to say, we can, rather than just pay people to create data like we always do, and that does not succeed in creating the kind of data we need, we can augment that by offering novel incentives like fun, or the chance to work on a citizen science project or whatever, that attract different people than the ones who were attracted by the offer of you know, $5 or whatever for the, for the hit. Um, that uh, those, that crowd attracted by the novel incentive of fun um, can actually become a self-sustaining entity and can produce data sets that we can use that have uh, reasonable accuracy compared to the ones that we spend a lot of money to create. Um, it's also an interesting field because there are uh, less incentives than paid annotation for bad behavior. So if you cheat, nothing happens. You don't get any more money and you don't show up on a leaderboard or anything. Um, and it's also interesting because the ethics are different, right? So if you're pay doing paid crowdsourcing, you have to watch to make sure your hit rate is appropriate for the routine. In this case, there's no promise of money. People are not attracted by money. They're never going to get money from this. So the ethics of the question are a bit different. You still don't want to waste people's time, 
but obviously you, you're not worrying about am I abusing them by offering them a below, below minimum wage uh, for the place where they live. And the data that comes out of this supports, I think, experiments in language recognition, um, also studies of language confusability as the original game on which it was based, but of course I think this community mostly cares about language recognition data. And also if you're interested, experiments in the aggregation of crowdsourced data. So we've only done the simplest possible things with this data. You could very easily um, learn who the expert is and then do a weighted um, voting based on expertise or based on where they come from. We didn't try any of that. We were just going for the lowest hanging fruit um, to build a corpus uh, with um, with games. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chris, for your Thanks. presentation. Uh, do we have any questions in the audience? Oh, please. Hi, thank you for the talk. I have a question. Do you think that in a year from now, people will play this game? A game should be exciting or interesting, and we want to know the answer to our questions, whether we are right or not. And at the end, we just click and we don't know what happened. And we have space and vendor, so why to play your game and not spa space and vendor or any other game? Mm -hmm. So the game um, has been running for two and a half years so far, um, and the rate of sort of decline of the size of the pool has been very, very gradual. We haven't added any energy to that pool. We haven't advertised since the first couple of months of the game, so it does seem to be self-sustaining. Uh, players do get feedback on the languages during normal play. It's only during the bonus rounds, which are um, about half of the time you're in bonus round where you're, make, where you're earning more points but not getting feedback. So there is an opportunity to improve your skill set. Um, and, you know, of course, it's not as much fun as Space Invaders. Um, it's not even as much fun as the Great Language Game. Um, we were getting fewer players uh, than the Great Language Game was getting. But we are producing data that the community can use to do language recognition experiments. In the case of the Great Language Game, as far as I can see, there's not much use for it if you're doing LRE because the clips are, we already know what the clips are. So unless you care about, you know, what, what language do speakers of some language confuse some other language for? That's the confusability question. If that's what you're interested in, then GLG has a free data set of 18 million uh, hits. That would be very useful for that. But if you want to um, add training data to your uh, LRE models, um, there's not much juice in 50 or so clips per language. Uh, this is producing 600 um, new clips per language in this in this data set. Okay, thank you. Which uh, is about, uh, I mean, at least like in the LRE, the corporate that are behind the LRE, they're typically like sort of 200 every year being uh, handed over to NIST to make their cuts to produce the LRE corpora. So it's it's larger than those. Any other question? Oh, there's a question. Can you please? So actually, I have two questions. So first question would be, uh, you are using very limited uh, number of languages, uh, which is probably a good idea for the start. But do you plan to expand to more languages? Thanks very and, much. And yes, second sir. question yeah. will be, uh, do you treat somehow the native speakers more uh, like, uh, for example, if you have something like uh, spoken in uh, Ukrainian language language, and 19% uh, of the people in the world will say, yeah, that's Russian for sure. And one Ukrainian will say, they no, that's Ukrainian. Do you treat this answer like more importantly or not? Thanks for those questions, those are great. Um, so for the next version, I was hoping someone would ask this question. So for the next version, we're working on a hundred language version of the game which does introduce new challenges, right? Because if you look at the list of even the, say, top 100 languages by native speakers um, or the ones that the community has worked on, there are languages that you wouldn't expect to have great recognition except among their native speakers. So in other words, you wouldn't, they wouldn't be recognized out across the world necessarily. So you have to have some mechanism for maybe gradually introducing people uh, first to say a, do a few dozen languages and then expanding if they seem good at the game. So we're working on that currently. Um, you're exactly right about uh, this problem of how different people recognize a language. And it's not just 
based on expertise, it's also based on other kind of socio-political factors. And it's not only limited, in fact, to game players. We actually see, the LDC sees this when we build regular corporate for LRE, that if we're not careful how we recruit people, you will get some people who will say things like, I don't even want to say them, language X is really just a dialect of language Y. And then some other people will say, no, language X and language Y are completely different languages. And they'll argue over that. And I don't want to name the languages because I don't want to upset anybody. But those are arguments that happen all the time. And you know, even um, annotators um, may be susceptible to, to those arguments and not, not base their decisions only on things like mutual intelligibility. Um, so yeah, that's a general problem that we're aware of. So we do include in the corpus the information about you know, what the purported language was, what the guest language was, what the distractors were, and where the person came from, and if they're registered, what they say their native language is, so that you could actually, if you cared to, try to use that information to, I don't know, weight the value of their judgment. Okay, thank you. I think we're, yep. we're done, right? Okay, let's thank the thank speaker you. again. Thank you.